rookie era. Good way to start, everyone. Good afternoon. I was on mute. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the second in a series of four webinars around the eating, drinking and swallowing uh, competency framework. Um, I'm Judith Broll. I'm the Director of Professional Development at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy. I'm a speech and language therapist by background. I've been a college dysphagia advisor for far too long, and I've also been a manager of um, some speech and language therapy organizations. Uh, organizations who I really understand how to um, how this work is is really very important. Um, I'll be chairing this um, very exciting webinar today um, and could I have the next slide please? I think just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, there is some staff on hand to help with any technical issues and please just contact them initially through the chat button. But what we're going to do to ensure that we get your full attention is we're not going to have the chat button going through the whole of this webinar. So if you've got any questions or comments, we would really like and welcome them through the Q&A button. Um, and, and again, we will be monitoring that during the, the presentation. And then at the end, we'll, be, we'll try and answer as many as we can to, on today's webinar. It is going to be a recorded webinar and like with all of them, they will be available on the website along with the presentation. And I think that's really important because I know it's really hard for us, for many people to, to get out of clinical practice to come to these webinars and please do uh, disseminate them as widely as you can to your colleagues. Um, and at the end of the webinar, you will have a pop up window asking for your evaluation. We'd be really grateful for your comments about how to do things better or differently in the future. Next, please. I think what's really important in these webinars is, is, how, is the, the how to do stuff. I think we've spent a long time so far writing the frameworks, considering what needs to go in, what needs to come out. And now is the time to stop talking and start doing and implementing this framework. We've had a very a fabulous group, and I know that Hannah's going to talk more about a very robust process and getting this um, over the line and, and getting them out to you all. And now it's the time to think about how, how to actually do that. And this week, we're really focusing on the rationale for why we're doing things, and in particular, around the hours. Just in case you're on the wrong webinar now, next week is about signing off the competencies and the endpoint assessment. So I hope you will stay with us today, because I think they're all going to be useful, and all together, the overarching um, uh, conglomeration will be really useful. And the next one, please. And it is my absolute pleasure to be joined today by three fantastic colleagues who I'm hoping will you'll be pleased to see there there to hear from them and not from me anymore. But first we have Hannah Crawford, who's a professional head of speech and language therapy in Tees, Esk and Weir Valley NHS Foundation Trust, and also one of the lead authors on the competency framework. We're also joined by Shifra Mulkerin, who's clinical lead speech and language therapist at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridgeshire, um, and she was on the working group um, and the England clinical rep. And we're also joined by Susan Guthrie, who's an advanced practitioner speech and language therapist from Leeds and York Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. So welcome all. And to start off, I'm going to hand over to Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, and thanks for um, asking me to present at this webinar today. Um, as Judith says, I'm Professional Head of Speech and Language Therapy at Tees Eskin Weir Valleys, and I was one of the lead authors on the Competency Framework in partnership with Paula Leslie. Paula was the lead academic author and I was the lead clinical author. Next slide, please. So, um, just to give you a bit of background as to how that kind of authorship and working group developed, we um, completed an application process. Um, it's one of the most robust processes I've taken part um, in as part of work I've done in for our CSLT, we had to submit an application and um, we developed a working group that was equally composed of academic um, members and clinical members. So we had clinical members from each of the four devolved nations of which Shifra is one representative and academic reps from each of the four devolved nations. And then Paula and I, who were the clinical authors for each uh, component of that. Um, and the work has been funded by Health Education England, so a really robust um, kind of establishment of the project and, and, and how we comprise the working group. I think there was quite a lot of interest in being a member of the working group, and so from that we were able to develop um, a, a sort of consultation group as well, where we took some of the, the tricky things that we were battling with as, as the core working group, so we really did quite a lot of um, 
consultation before we even um, then sent that out to member consultation. The member consultation took place in January, and, and I believe it's one of it is the biggest consultation we've ever um, engaged in for, on behalf of RCSLT, and um, you know upwards of three hundred um, members consulted on that on on the document. So we fit, think that's kind of really successful, and we published the competency framework in February two thousand and twenty one. Um, there are going to be ongoing. There have been ongoing conversations with members um, as, as part of this piece of work, and a lot of that um, consultation with members has informed these webinars, so that we're able to sort of bottom out some of the issues that members have asked questions about. And there is going to be ongoing work looking at sort of how, the implementation of the framework and what additional support materials we develop. Um, so just for information, there. Um, are the members of the, the core working group. Um, and I'll just leave you to look at that for a little bit. And, and obviously these will be available as part of the webinar if you want to just understand who, who's taken part in that core working group. So I'm now gonna hand you over to one of my colleagues on the working party, Shifra, who's gonna talk to you a little bit more about kind of what those hours look like. Thanks very much, Hannah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me um, here today. I've been asked to present on the topic of placement hours. Um, can I have my first select, please? Thank you. So placement hours were a key consideration and discussion point for the working group in developing the EDS competency framework. And as I'm sure most of you are already aware, the framework stipulates for a total of 60 direct SLT supervised hours as part of the pre-registration training of which at least 30 hours are with an adult population and at least 10 hours are with a pediatric population. So I'll, fo um, I'll focus my slides um, on the general themes of what is an hour and what makes up a placement hour in EDS pre-registration training. So we're really hopeful that today's webinar will really just provide you all with some reassurance that a lot of the placements that you're currently offering are providing EDS hours and EDS opportunities to learners. And for those of you that feel like you aren't offering those, um, offering those hours, I hope that you'll see that there's plenty of scope within the placements you're already offering to give these opportunities. So firstly, what is an hour? The purpose of placement hours is to provide learners with opportunities for real life experience and exposure to service users and their lived experience of eating, drinking and swallowing. As a working group, we feel that this is an important component of pre-registration training, but we also acknowledge that this is only one component of the learning process. The working group are in agreement that hours don't necessarily equate to competency and the purpose of stipulating hours is simply to ensure that learners have exposure to eating, drinking and swallowing in the clinical setting as part of their training. Therefore, providing placement hours alone and signing off on those hours won't necessarily mean that the learner is competent but rather it's an acknowledgement that the learner has had opportunities to experience eating, drinking um, and swallowing difficulties with different populations and with different settings. And the learner can evidence this through their hours log. Secondly, when talking about what makes an hour, we're simply referring to any work that a learner completes that has a direct impact on the service user. So naturally, we think this involves the face-to-face -face assessment and intervention of a service user with eating, drinking and swallowing difficulties. And it does but also other activities that relate to the service user are also included. So for example, writing reports, formulating therapy programs, or doing your notes, carrying out training sessions for parents or carers, um, or any MDT working or case conferences that relates to the service user. So this list isn't exhaustive, but it simply shows you that everything counts towards the placement hour. And I will also say that we recognize that eating, drinking and swallowing difficulties don't often exist in isolation in the clinical setting and that the role of speech and language therapy is dynamic. So it's likely that the hour may not be exclusively EDS focused and could involve communication input, for instance. And that's OK. 
So as long as there is an EDS component to the hour, we can be satisfied that this can be included as part of the placement hour. So if I can just have my second slide, please. And my second slide is simply just highlighting that including placement hours aligns our competency framework with the RCSLT curriculum guidance and advocates that direct client-centric care experience is required for learners to develop their HCPC standards of proficiency in this area. So I'll now pass you back to Hannah, is that right? Thank you. Thank you, Shifra. So, um, just from a clinician and manager's perspective, um, I just wanted to give you some of my reflections about, um, the, about the implementation of this framework. I think from a, from a clinician and manager's perspective, I feel really strongly that we've got a requirement to support our student learners. The, 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 they're our next generation of workforce, and we have that, that responsibility within our job descriptions, but also from a manager's perspective, working and supporting students is, is a really positive step for our recruitment and retention. And we, we're able to um, document that and, and, and also benefit from that in terms of things like our student tariff. I think it's really important to acknowledge how difficult COVID has been for the delivery of services altogether, never mind supporting students. So we do acknowledge that thinking about how we extend what we deliver to students at a time when services have been struggling with, with managing delivery within the context of COVID is difficult. And my sense is that talking with kind of regional placement leads, that, that it's felt sometimes really difficult to think about how we support students at all, but actually thinking creatively and, and the demands that have been placed on us to think creatively as a result of COVID actually gives us the opportunity to think differently about placements moving forward. Um, and in some areas, we've managed to expand our delivery with a combination of blended, so face-to-face -face and virtual placement experiences, as well as thinking, us to, to pushing us to think innovatively about placements. So I think reflecting on COVID and thinking about, okay, how do we draw this um, requirement into our working um, environment moving forward? How can we think innovatively about it and incorporate what we're doing with students? And for me, um, it helps us credit what we're already delivering, if I'm honest, about students' experience. So for almost all the services that I manage, eating and drinking and swallowing is a component of what the speech therapists do alongside communication. And so historically, we've not been able to credit that learning for students. And now that gives us um, a, and the students a framework to incorporate what they're already no doing. And, and I'm really interested, actually, I think in terms of the placements we deliver in our service, the students actually get more hours. They sometimes come for longer days than kind of those, those two sessions. They sometimes come in on an extra day to see something really interesting. So for me, um, I think it, it feels like actually just consolidating what we're already delivering to students. It allows us to incorporate some of the more highly specialist clinicians. So my clinical role prior to taking on this um, manager's position was as a consultant speech therapist in dysphagia and that was really hard then for me to commit to taking a full-time student because I wasn't able to um, give them the learning opportunities that, that were previously mandated but what this will allow us to do is to incorporate clinicians who are working in that highly specialist environment to give some exposure to those students and, and so that the students can get a broader learning opportunity but also those clinicians can, can continue to support students but also, as Shifra's talked about, it also allows us to incorporate services where dysphagia isn't necessarily a key focus. So maybe thinking about, for example, in the services we work, a student could spend time in a day centre kitchen looking at how uh, uh, kitchen staff are modifying foods for service users. We could look at how support staff feel about um, supporting people to eat and drink and thinking more, really more broadly about how we can offer those opportunities. So. Next slide, please, Kaylee. So yeah, eating and drinking is a reality of many um, workplaces. So not only um, 
around that issue of incorporating um, what students are already learning and really um, clarifying that and giving credence to that learning and, and students able being, to, being able to log and evidence that learning. It's really important for me as an employer that we're going to have newly qualified new graduates equipped to take some level of responsibility in eating and drinking and swallowing. And that's a really huge bonus for me as an employer. And I think it's really helpful as well to know what level of knowledge, competency and exposure NQPs are going to arrive with in the workplace and where they've trained and that's been documented, that will be hugely helpful. So then we can work with those new graduates to understand what their exposures consisted of and what we need to build on within the workplace and, and that will be more straightforward. And then it will help us decide which modality is a better fit to build on that knowledge, whether it's looking at post basic training or whether it's bolstering that learning within house competency. Um, and, I, and I think that will help us with a much more bespoke approach to um, our career development. And actually, it helps us again align with a more a more linear approach to um, just the eat, drinking, and swallowing delivery, rather than this kind of stepped approach where NQPs arrive not able to take on any real responsibility with eating and drinking and swallowing, and having to do that you know post basic training before we can um, before they're equipped to take on any level of responsibility. And it will help us align with our band three and four SLT broad workforce, who in our service do do work in dysphagia where the new grads can't. So, so for me as an employer, I think it's a really positive step forward. So I'll hand you on now to Susan Guthrie, one of our colleagues working in Leeds and York Partnership Trust to talk about her perspective. Thanks, Hannah. And thank you very much for um, having me to present today. It's really, really exciting to see the work that's being done. So thank you all for all your hard work. Um, it was really interesting to reflect on um, how I might implement some of your recommendations. Do you want to show the next slide? Um, so this was just my reflecting on all the opportunities that might come up in a mental health inpatient setting where I could help the learners develop or at least get some exposure to eating, drinking and swallowing. Um, and it was interesting to have a look at the core capabilities that are listed as part of the, the workshop work. Um, so the first one being communication. And if you look at this list on the slide, it all involves developing communication skills, students developing their sensitivity and their self-awareness. Um, obviously, person-centered approaches around eating, drinking and swallowing are um, opportunities in themselves. Um, and very often it's more the psychosocial side of um, the meal times that students can perhaps first start being involved with. Um, they could join in with a meal time. They could start to reflect on how that looks for the people that uh, are on the wards um, as inpatients. Um, the core capabilities also refer to partnerships, and that's a huge part of what we do, isn't it? So looking at the MDT working, understanding the speech and language therapist's role and how that fits with the roles of others looking at opportunities for sharing and enabling others, but also understanding perhaps the limits of how far our roles might reach or, or not reach. Um, and I think working on the wards, just being part of the meal times, being part of the support that uh, other staff are offering um, and joining in with that gives them a real sense and an opportunity to develop their skills. Um, the, one of the core capabilities is research and evidence based. So, um, throughout the placement, the students can get an opportunity to, to look at what evidence base is there in the field of mental health. It's scant, shall we say, so it's an opportunity perhaps for them to go away and do a bit of investigation and just try and um, set up their interest in research with a little r, you know, research that they can perhaps start looking around the evidence base and understanding what's supporting the different interventions, assessments that are available to them. I think it's also about signposting the, the learners into where else they might um, put their attention um, and just understanding some safe ways of working um, on mental health wards. It's often very much a sort of uh, hands-off approach. It's very much um, perhaps observation rather than um, we don't do much laryngeal palpation, shall I say. And uh, so it's a case of students understanding how to adapt what they might have learned in other settings and, and what's um, the best approach and what's right for the, the people that uh, we're working with. Um, 
And I think specific to mental health settings also, there's an awful lot to learn about sort of the legal aspects, looking at capacity assessment, making decisions about eating, drinking and swallowing and understanding where the person's interests might be, understanding their culture and their wishes. Um, and so making sure that you get an opportunity to look at person-centered approaches in, in all its glorious detail. And I think underpinning all of this is looking at levels of insight in both the patient and the staff that you're working with. So there's a huge range really of um, stuff that you can be exposed to and really have a meaningful contribution as you're learning to develop your skills in this area. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's nice to nice to hear the threads running through so many different areas. So thank you very much for that. Could I have my next slide, please? I think what's next? This this project feels like this sort of very slow rumbling piece of work that is just keeps on moving. And it is actually only the start of a much, much bigger piece of work, which I might touch on if I've got time a bit later on. I think having talked to many colleagues about the, the issue of hours and how to actually log it, I think what we need to now think about is how to support both or everybody to support the learner to make sure that logging the hours is something which is useful and easy and identifiable. So we're, what we are planning on doing is putting together a centralised logging system ultimately linked to the RCSL TCPD diary. In my aspirational dreams, we might do that by maybe Christmas, but we need to get this up and running for the beginning of next academic year from 2021 September, when the newest cohort are starting to be taught against this framework. And within that, we're going to get together a small working group to find out the best platform trying to work out the new language here, to actually put these logging the hours and evidencing the hours, because this is all about evidencing the exposure for the learners against this framework. That is our bottom line with it, because we need a way to show that there is consistency of availability for all students. So we are that is a work in progress. We're going to try and get a task and finish group together quite quickly. And I think that's going to be number one, very exciting. And some of the things that we're already discussing is could it be linked to an app so it's really easy for somebody out and about just to, to log it as they go on the wards, as well as it would then link into their that their diaries or some some tool online and I think what that will do and some feedback already said but you know isn't that going to be nice that a new grad arrives at a, for an interview and says look here is my log to say these are the hours that I have already done in my exposure to EDS and also if we can fill it in somehow what sort of experiences they have had so that new employees going back to what Hannah was saying around the new, new workforce and being a manager will have a really good understanding and better than we do now I might suggest as a, an ex-manager trying to, um, to, to interview uh, new grads of what their experience is in their pre-reg status and actually how valuable that is so that's what we want to do is quite soon get this tool together it's this mythical beast at the moment everybody if and actually if anybody on this call has any anything that they are using locally they would like to share with us we'd be we're not reinventing the wheel we have to just all work together on this if anybody are and ask is if you've got some tools that you like send it through and we'll put together some conglomeration of them all um I think the, the other thing to say is that we have also identified that some of these competencies do not need to be delivered face to face. So part of the money that, that Hannah mentioned that we got from Health Education England is to, to fund us to do some simulation work and to get some simulation teaching to support these competencies. HEE were very generous and they understand that we are all a profession under pressure and actually having to deliver all 20 competencies either in the clinical setting and or in an HEI is just maybe a bit of an ask too far. So what they're doing is they're giving us a pot of money to actually tender and, and procure and to write or develop or to use if it's out there some kind of simulation package to support some of these competencies. So there is a new document that has just been um, launched, if you like, where the, the working group has gone through 
the, um, the, the competency framework and identified which one of these competencies needs to be delivered and signed off face to face. It needs to be against a real life human being and which could be and the ones that really could either be taught in an HEI and or taught through SIM or taught in the real world. They're not mutually exclusive. It depends on your environment, but there is a, le a level of flexibility. But I think everybody felt having understanding and deep diving and picking out the ones that needed to be done face to face was really important because otherwise that's the bit that proves the real sort of hands on competency piece. So that is available on our website and we'll put some links in there for you to that. And because this is a huge piece of work, we are about to advertise for a new role to help support that. So I suppose this is just a plea from me and my colleagues at RCSLT, is if you're interested in this work and would like to join us, the role will be going out in the next, whenever we can get it out probably, the next two to three weeks if we can do it, because we need some more help, especially with the SIM piece, but also around this implementation work. And we're going to do some work around setting up um, uh, communities of practice so we can all sit and learn and listen to each other. Next slide, please. I could talk about this for an extremely long time, but I'm not going to. And I would really like now, so thank you for your time, to open the floor to some questions. And I can see some really interesting ones have come through. And I wondered if um, the one question I'm going to maybe talk to either to Hannah or Shifra who were on the working group is there was a question about whether it's expected that students will be having their theoretical learning before their practical placements. I don't know which who'd like to answer that one. I'm happy to respond to it. I don't know if I've got a direct answer. What we've tried to do with the whole piece of work is to make it as flexible as possible for HEIs and for practice educators. So, um, and, and for HEIs who are already delivering um, the a dysphagia module, for example, to, to, or, or whatever they were delivering in eating and drinking, swallowing, for them to have to make as few changes as possible. And also to look at how those transferable skills might just need to be signposted a little bit more clearly. Um, and we were trying to make that in as much the gift of the HEIs rather than mandating, you know, you must, for example, do a dysphagia block as part of year one. So we haven't actually mandated that, um, just that, that it happens across the, the span of the training. Um, in the same way, I noticed a question about um, paediatric exposure and actually no placement is required to deliver all the hours the students will develop those hours over the course of all their exposure so it may be that if you're in a setting that has very limited contact with eating drinking and swallowing issues it may be that you deliver one hour of that um, and that's a long you know maybe um, there's a child in, in your setting who has been managed by someone else who has eaten and drinking difficulties and that child or that child's family are prepared to speak to the student about their experiences, um, not that you would be delivering hours and hours of, of exposure. Um, so there isn't a hard and fast answer to when the students will have learned that, but I guess in partnerships with the practice educators and the HEIs, you deliver placements to, it's about understanding where that student will be in their learning journey and what exposure is appropriate to offer as part of that. And I think it's really important as well not to conflate exposure with competency like she for a discuss. Exposure and competency are two different things. And actually, if you as a practice educator aren't as confident in eating and drinking and swallowing, you're not being asked to sign off a competency by delivering two or three hours of exposure. Um, they're two very different things. They're linked, obviously, but but they're not the same thing. So if you aren't confident, or, or you know, you you come from a generation that I do, where some therapists are qualified in dysphagia and some are not, it doesn't mean that you can't offer that exposure to students that you're with, but you're not necessarily signing off the competencies. But sign off is something we'll discuss in more detail at the next webinar. Shifa, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that as part of the working group. No, I think you covered it. Um, and actually, I think in the process of that, you've answered a few of the other questions around kind of, um, yeah, around competency answering the hours. So thank you. Thank you. I think just to just to follow up on that, just to say, 
we were trying to get a document together that covers that that was wide enough to be able to be used by all HEIs of which there are 19 and forever growing across four nations and for all settings so we had this really interesting dynamic where we had to put together some kind of framework that works across all of that so in some ways we tried to be really really prescriptive but then equally we respect that each organization whether that's an HEI or a clinical setting will have different needs around that so it's finding that balance between it so I'm not sure that helps so that you may find that in some places they'll be on placement before they've got their theory but actually having that exposure will actually inform their theory later on or vice versa and I think it's about I know that some of the working group and it's been fascinating just sitting back and listening it's about empowering learners and learning and not students they're learners to to almost sort of learn in a very different way and I think they've all had to we've all had to over the last year as well and and how much responsibility we take or not to take I think is also something to think about as well um, in that space so I hope that answers that question. Um, there was another one about whose responsibility would it fall to to log the hours, the student or the practice educator? Um, again, I don't know who would like to answer that. Shifra, can I ask you to give it a go to begin with? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, I think I'd say um, with regards to that question, I think it's not really any different to how students are currently logging their communication hours. It's not something that's, that's kind of um, beyond what they're already doing in a communication field. I think my experience has always been that students um, usually come to placement with their hours log and then as a practice educator you kind of work with them through the placement to ensure that they have that exposure and can just sign off as as you go along and um, Hannah do you have anything else to add to, think, that, to that I think primarily it's got to be the student because those hours will be recruited accrued across different placements so I think you know the student's got to hold the responsibility of of the cumulative log but that as as you say Shifra um just sort of if there's any uncertainty about you know you might be saying as a practice educator right on this appointment you're going to you know you're going to be able to log this time for both communication and disclosure because we're going to talk about both um, or, you know, to come out and say, do you know what, that ended up being completely dysphagia or, you know, we're going to have to go back and do another session for the eating and drinking. So I think I think it's got to be the student primarily because it will be accrued across the period of their whole learning journey. Um, but but in, 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 in discussion with each of the practice educators as, as they move through the placements, if it's not clear, and I'm expecting it probably will be, and, and, and forgive me for jumping ahead because I saw a Q&A that talked about is there a list available, we've given examples, but I think this is our speech therapy workforce, you know, I'm really proud of, we're innovative, we are skilled, and we're trusting the workforce to understand what they feel is an eating, drinking, swallowing activity. And, and as soon as we deliver a prescriptive list, we've missed stuff off and we'll have people saying, but we do this in our setting. You know, we trust the workforce in the same way we trust the workforce. It's exactly the same as communication. We trust the workforce to be giving, and we know that the workforce are giving students, learners, really rich placement opportunities. And, and this isn't, we don't feel this is anything different. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, can I ask, there's another question that's come in about whether or not we're planning on giving more guidance around um, the difference between achieved and developing in terms of consistency for HIs and placements. I think we might cover that more next week in terms of hours, um, but I think Again, there will probably need to be some some more discussions around that. But I think it's interesting that the thinking is going on. It's it, the the hour. Do, there is two new documents that are just being um, launched. One document is saying what is an hour, which is the one that Shifra was talking about, and the other one is around what is face to face and what isn't face to face. Um, and then the last one is around what to expect. The endpoint is which we'll talk about more next week. So if we could maybe park that. Um, and then there's another question from an HEI asking, um, from an HEI perspective, what would happen if students don't meet the competencies and accrue the necessary placement hours? 
um, from a, I wonder, it's a bit of a challenging one, isn't it? Who would like to consider that one as, a, as an answer? Hannah. I'm happy to start. I think we've, we've, um, we've considered this and I think the, the sort of the polite challenge back would be what happens if they don't do it in communication. Um, I think, you know, we're not looking at any extra hours here. So we're looking at how we can incorporate that eating, drinking, swallowing exposure within the hours the students are already doing. So we're not asking for anything additional. We're just asking for identification of which, which bits of time. And I think probably a lot of students are already spending some of this time um, focused on eating, drinking and swallowing. Um, and, and what happens with those students who don't achieve those? hours across their placements um, and we have looked at um, the kind of which competencies need to be achieved and, and again I think the question is the same about what happens with students who don't achieve those communication competencies and, and my understanding is that that will be a mock-up placement we occasionally have to offer them. And can I just jump in there as well, just to follow on from what Hannah said? I mean, I don't think that 60 hours is is that is 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 that a big a number to achieve. And I think um obviously there will be some responsibility on us as clinicians and practice educators to be really mindful to support the HEIs in terms of how we offer placements and ensuring that we are offering as much as we, as we can in order to support students to have the opportunities to, to attain competency, but also to meet their, their demand for hours as well. Thank you. That is, that is really helpful. I, I think it's going to be an, an ongoing and evolving discussion. I think, I think that's why from the very get-go, I thought it was really important that we had the HEIs and clinicians working together on this document. And so it is going to be an ongoing collaboration between the two organisations to make sure that these learners get what they need. And it might be a wraparound thing. And I think we need to work out you know, how, how, who's going to do what and, and in what ways. I'm just trying to listen and read the chat. I realise I can't do both very well. So Apologies if I look a little bit blank. Many of these questions around sign off and competency sign off. I'd like to just pause here because we are planning on talking about that in our next webinar. So that's the cliffhanger that I would suggest you we will answer in more detail on the next um, webinar. Um, I think what's what's really interesting is um, something that keeps coming up, and I think this this does influence. The discussion about what is an hour and it's really what you were touching on Susan about how you can pull the threads through of all sorts of things is the difference but we have made very clearly that this is a document about eating drinking and swallowing and not dysphagia and therefore the hours need to be thought of slightly differently maybe and I can see say in your setting Susan it's going to be very different to say to Shifras which is a cute setting to so I don't know if you, I don't know what you use clinically, Susan, whether you use dysphagia or whether you use eating, drinking and swallowing, whether you have a view of the difference. Or we do tend to refer to eating, drinking and swallowing. Um, and I'm always very interested in the sort of conversations we have about when we start to design an intervention, how we pull in the, the patient's perspective, but also the MDT and any family or other uh, people involved. It's, it's such a, a wide range of views before we start to um, perhaps design an intervention. It's not saying that we would compromise our advice as a speech and language therapist, but it's just being aware of the influences and the wider perspective. And I think that's something a student can really benefit from. And I think listening to all the questions, what I was just reflecting on is, just acknowledging the mutual benefit when you, uh, a learner or a student walks through the door, what they bring is sometimes there's a fantastic new set of ideas, there's a new objectivity, there's the opportunity they have to go and perhaps do a bit of extra reading or some seeking out of information that perhaps as a busy clinician you wouldn't have time for. Um, and I just really value that extra pair of hands and finding ways for them to be sort of focused on the EDS side, I think is, is often a, a mutual benefit that we shouldn't lose sight of. I think, and I, you've just made me think there, Susan, as well, you know, we take um, some students on kind of project placements um, and our physios recently took six students on one placement on a leadership placement um, and 
for example, one of the projects that uh, our students done has worked with one of our clinical leads to design a leaflet about thickness for surface users. Now that's really, really valuable eating, drinking, swallowing experience. It involved reading around the literature. It involved doing some work with service users about you know, how accessible the leaflet was. You can see that's blending both communication and eating, drinking, swallowing exposure information. You know, um, and, and the physio um, leadership placement has been really um, innovative. It's taken six students, done a lot of work around some virtual stuff as well as um, face to face stuff. They've, they've had to develop proposals for a commissioning panel, um, work together. They've sat through a proper commissioning process and they developed two proposals. One was chosen um, and then all students work together on kind of an interview process and everything. Now you can see how you would gear that potentially around eating, drinking, swallowing. It's just thinking about how we respond to this innovatively for the benefit of the services as well. You know, we've received a really brilliant leaflet that we are. You, we've gone through our comms and we're going to use with service users across all services. You know, the physios had a brilliant business plan for an innovation, a clinical innovation that they want to develop. So it's it's just thinking really creatively. And, and that's their examples of stuff that we've done post COVID out of necessity. But actually, they trigger more ideas about how we can work with our learners for the benefit of everybody. And that was six students. So that was also fit the student expansion thing as well for the physios. I think you're right. I think the, the MDT aspect is often something that perhaps isn't covered um, in sort of the learning at the HCI. And I think that is that's new territory very often, I find, understanding where we all fit together, how we you know involve the service user, but also how you know where our, our roles reach to, you know, what we can hand over and feeling confident about that. I think it's really good practice. Um, yeah. And we're thinking about how we can blend those placements across the MD AHPs. So that we could that physio placement would have lent itself to all of the AHPs to contribute. It would have lent itself probably to having a service user on that panel. We're looking at how we can coordinate those across the HEIs, even so we have students from different HEIs on these placements, and the flexibility that a blended approach to placements has afforded us because of COVID makes all this much more possible and it's broadened our thinking around this. So we're really excited about the agenda really good to hear how I think it does I think it's good. it takes a lot of planning and a lot of thinking but I think ultimately this is all this is a time to be really creative around all of these things and, and I think this conversation is probably being picked up in the chat as well which is really interesting as well and I think that's why it was quite hard to disaggregate what we're going to talk about on which webinar and of course there's going to be touch points across them because it's you can't cut this up into chunks so you're absolutely right is that we need to think about this in the widest piece ultimately i would like to think that all of these competencies will be subsumed into the normal business as usual competencies of training we won't need to log them off separately and they'll just be business as usual so we can concentrate on other things back to that holistic piece so that the students can then see the whole patient putting them right in the center as you were saying susan and then so they will be able to be equipped to do both the, the, the eating drinking and swallowing and the communication in one person and then go and talk to their multidisciplinary colleagues with both hats on and i think we need to have these hours if i'm going to bring it back to this to ensure that that happens now so that we we have to sort of almost change the way we think about this and one of you said earlier which is true we need to demystify this to make sure that it becomes our other business as usual and we have been charged from external organizations that we as a professional body we as a profession are the leads in eating drinking swallowing dysphagia whatever you want to call it and so this is really our time to own it and i think this is part of that um, that sounds a bit like a rallying cry. It's not meant to be like that. It's just meant to be that's how it is. And I think we need to, to really embrace it. And I think the fact we've got so many interested people on the call today and so many questions shows that there is a real interest in doing that. We could talk on forever, but I'm also aware of the time. Could, it, could I just pick up one? I'm just scanning the Q&A and obviously we can't address every single one, but I've picked up one about ethical issues regarding questions to vulnerable clients or children. We aren't advocating that you would do any of that without consent. I just want to make that really clear. But 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 just thinking sort of broadly around the opportunities that that uh, you know might be available in settings, but we're not advocating that you would do anything without consent just to develop co uh, competencies or exposure. 
um, and that anything we you did do in, in a more generic setting, obviously we need to ask for consent or permission. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much indeed. All questions that we have not answered today, we will take away, we will keep all your comments very safely and we will either answer them in another document that we will resend out to you after this webinar and or it will help inform us form the, the content of the next week's webinar, um, which is going to be um, equally interesting, I think. So I, I, I wanted to wrap it up now, but just to let you know about the next two webinars uh, in the consecutive Thursdays, the next one is about practical competencies and how to sign them off. And the, the final one in this series is the opportunities for paediatric placements. And I think that might answer some of the questions that were coming through today, because I think that's really important that we understand that piece in all of this. So finally, I know that um, my colleague Kaylee would like you to answer some kind of evaluation of how what you thought and, that we're, and, and any comments gratefully received. And I wanted to thank our fabulous panel today. Thank you so much. Shifra, Hannah and Susan, I'm reading you down, down, down my screen. It was so interesting just to hear your reflections as well. It's been sitting in my head for a long, long time. If there's anything further you'd like to comment on, we'd be really, really interested in hearing from you. We're all in this together and we will be doing this as an iterative process. So thank you so much indeed. We look forward to working with you and um, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. So thank you and goodbye.